thank you. Welcome to this launch of the European Law Open. I'm Diamond Ash Yagbo, and I'm Professor of Law at the University of Kent and a member of the editorial board of this new journal. Um, I just want to tell you how excited and delighted we are to uh, have this launch. It's such a pity it couldn't be in person, but then we'd have to be in Brussels, Copenhagen, Luxembourg, Paris, London, Canterbury, all at once. So in a way, this is so much more accessible and open. Um, I'm I'm going to just very briefly hand over to, as I said, we've got an editorial board of about 18 or 20 of us, but there's four people in particular that I really want you to be introduced to today. That's Professor Maria Bartle, Professor Joanna Mendes, Professor Agustin Jose Menendez, and Professor Harm Schaefer. I'm going to hand over now to Joanna just to set the scene and explain why we decided to establish this journal, what we're hoping to do, why it is such a different project, um, giving a platform for study, research, debates, dialogues about the European Union and Europe generally. So handing over now to Joanna. Thank you, Diamond. I, I won't take much time. And, and uh, Maria Harm, Augustine, feel free to complete anything that I say or leave unsaid, essentially, uh, when I'm done. I just want to say a very brief words about the decision to create a new journal, which was both an obvious decision, but also a very difficult decision. It was obvious because there it is clear that we think and we hope that there is a space for a, a journal of the type that we are creating. There are fundamental questions about uh, EU law, about EU integration and the role of law in EU integration that lawyers or EU law scholars are no longer asking or have never asked that we want to foster in the journal questions that we think that we believe are important to understand EU law today, how very, how EU law uh, shapes mechanisms of power and money generation, how EU law delimits boundaries of exclusion along gender and racial um, aspects, how does it shape economic, social and cultural structures of the societies in which we live. Uh, all these are some among of many questions that we would like to see addressed in the journal. But it was also a very difficult decision because of the particular contexts and the challenges of academia that to a great extent work against us and work against the type of scholarship that we want to foster. So it was far from obvious. Um, we want to have, uh, as we said in the editorial, we want to have uh, to foster slow scholarship that stands the test of time. <laughs> and we want uh, scholarship that defies the assumptions, the established assumptions and construction, constructions that may no longer hold. But we also want scholarship that maybe confirms those constructions and assumptions, but with the same reflective and critical spirit that is needed to deconstruct them. So um, this is essentially what I had to say very briefly so that we don't take a lot of time. I just want to say one more thing. This is very much a collective project. So it's not, uh, even if, uh, Harm, Maria, Agustin and I took the initiative to bring these people together. It wouldn't work without all the members and each and every one of the members of the editorial board who are here today. And also with the fantastic, wonderful support uh, of CUP. They have been absolutely, it is truly a pleasure to work with them. So this is just what I wanted to say. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I just want to flag up something briefly um, to tomorrow that's happening tomorrow to give you a sense of what we're hoping to do with the journal. We're hosting an Emerging Scholars Workshop, which is a platform for researchers who are at the early stage of their academic careers, mostly in EU law, um, to have the benefit of learning about publishing and have an opportunity to have comments from us as board measure members on their research. And we particularly encourage applications from scholars from the Global South from underrepresented groups. And this is also reflected in the first issue, which you'll see has an article on European public law after empires, it's one of the heritage of imperialism of EU public law, um, a, a, an article on the baggage of Eurocentrism in the EU's peace and mediation across the world, an essay, an essay which asks the question, what can EU lawyers learn from critical theory? So I do, I'm posting into the chat a link to the first issue, it's free to read, it's free to download. I really encourage you to have a look, um, see what we're, we're offering. And also those of you who are engaged in research, please do, we're very much welcoming 
this opportunity also for us to encourage you to consider submitting a short piece, a long piece to the journal. That's a very much looking forward to seeing your submissions. Now I'm to turn to the substance of the launch. I'm so thrilled and, and really pleased that our three speakers have been accepted our invitation today. We're going to hear today from Professor Thomas Piketty, um, Professor Stephanie Pennett, and Professor Antoine Vachot. Uh, the way we're going to structure this afternoon's launch is first we'll hear from P Professor Piketty, uh, who will take the floor for talk about half an hour on issues of inequalities and democrat democratization of the EU. And after his talk, we'll have a discussion question answer because he has to leave on the hour. And then we'll turn to hear from Professor Hinnett, Professor Vachot, who will talk together, who will talk each for 15 minutes. And then we'll have another discussion about their papers. They will be talking about freedoms, rule of law and state of emergency. That's Professor Hinnett. And Professor Vachot will be talking about EU policy and the notion of publicness. I'll, I'll, introduce, I'll start by introducing Professor Piketty, perhaps he needs no introduction. Um, he's Professor of Economics at the School of Advanced Studies in, in uh, the Social and Social Sciences, um, a HESS in, in Paris. He's co-director of World Inequality Lab and the World Inequality Database. His research entails historical and theoretical work on the interplay between economic development, distribution of income and wealth, and political conflict. These works have led him to emphasize the role of political, social, and fiscal institutions in the historical evolution of income and wealth distribution. He's author of international bestsellers, Capital in the 21st Century, Capital and Ideology, and most recently, A Brief History of Equality. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Professor Piketty. Thank you very much. Yeah, th thanks a lot for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, you know, I'm very glad to see that you know this project is uh, is taking shape and, and welcoming uh, uh, non-lawyer like me. So I'm I'm going to try to use these slides. I assume can you see the slides now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. So. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm going to try uh, to talk about this uh, this topic, uh, socio-economic inequality and the democratization of Europe. So you know, I'm, as some of you may know, I, I have been involved uh, with actually with Antoine Vaucher and Stephanie Annette, who are going to talk to you later in this project, the Manifesto for the Democratization of Europe, which we. Uh, 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 published uh, a couple of years ago. That was uh, back in 2018, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to make a detailed presentation of, the, of, the, of this manifesto today, of course. But I, I want to, I want to talk about inequality in Europe, and I want to start by saying that you know the, the, the key objective behind this manifesto was to try to think about possible. Uh, reform of the institutional setup of Europe, and in particular, allowing for a subset of countries to move ahead toward a deeper uh, fiscal, uh, social, and political integration, uh, so as to be able to, to play a role in the reduction of social socioeconomic inequality in Europe. So wh why is it that we believe uh, that this is uh, so important and that we, we need to think at the intersection uh, between uh, uh, you know, European institutions European uh, law and uh, the evolution of socioeconomic inequality in Europe. Several reasons maybe for that. Uh, the first thing is that when you look at the socioeconomic pattern of voting over European issues, you have a pretty sad uh, and systematic uh, finding which can be summarized as follows. So here you have the pattern of vote uh, over the Brexit referendum in 2016. And so if you rank, so this is based on post-electoral survey, uh, 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 you know, very standard post-electoral survey where you ask people, okay, what's your education, what's your income, what's your wealth, and how did you vote in the election? And so what you see is that, you know, whether you rank individuals by income, education, wealth, uh, people in the top deciles of the distribution uh, were very enthusiastic about remaining in the European Union, which is good. Uh, uh, but people in the middle and in the bottom were very uh, uh, not enthusiastic about remaining in the European Union. And as we all know, uh, you know the exit. Uh, well, now what's very striking about this graph is that if you look at similar graph uh, trying to explain who votes for 
Labour Party, Conservative Party, Social Democrats, CDU, you know, various political parties across Europe, the class cleavage is never nearly as strong as what you get for voting over uh, Europe. Uh, in particular, I have shown in some other work that you know, the uh, education dimension and the wealth dimension have become disconnected over time. So you know, the high education elite voting more for center-left social democratic party and the high wealth elite voting more for center-right party. Now, what's very striking is that when you look at vote over European issues, sort of all the dimensions of class cleavages sort of uh, converge and give you a sort of consistent pattern, which is that, you know, whatever the dimension you look at, whether it's education, income, property ownership, when you're at the top, you tend to vote a lot in favor of Europe. When you're at the bottom, you know. Now, when you look at this, I mean, I don't know, you know, in, in other European countries, but in, in France, you know, sometimes we say, we tend to say, well, you know, but this is because of this uh, crazy uh, British uh, nationalist, you know, what can we do about them? Uh, you know, that's uh, the way it is. Well, except that if you look at the referendum that took place in France, you know, in 1992 and 2005, uh, this is what you get. So, you know, these are the two major referenda that, that happened in France. Uh, uh, over the uh, over the, the, the past 25 years, so in, in, if you look, you know, 1992, uh, you know, you have so the general pattern is that you know people at the at the top of the distribution that always tend to vote for the yes, and people at the bottom tend to vote for the no. Now in 1992. People in the bottom of the distribution vote only by a small margin for the no. So in the end, the people from the top decide, you know, sort of manage to get the Maastricht Treaty adopted, you know, with a 51% margin. So, you know, that was pretty small, but still, you know, even if there were, so, you know, it's only in the top decide, the support for the yes was sufficiently strong that it could compensate the no coming from the bottom 50%. Now, in 2005, uh, this was not sufficient uh, because, you know, even the top decile group were not quite enthusiastic about the yes in 1992, and the bottom groups were very negative. So, uh, you know, as we know, we had a huge margin for the no, you know, 55% for the no uh, in this referendum. Now, it's, you know, it's very striking that, you know, you take different European countries, in, so in this case, France, Britain, 1992, 2005, 2016. So, you know, you're looking at a quarter of a century, very different political culture, very different political history of how you join Europe and how you sort of feel and being part of Europe. You have this very strong pattern. Now, this is, this is questioning, I think, you know, for all of us, you know, we need, you know, it would be, I think it would be too simple to just ignore this and to say, well, okay, you know, there is some misunderstanding, uh, we need to explain better, people will, uh, will understand better if we better explain. You know, to me, I, you know, I am a European federalist or, you know, social federalist, as I like to say, with, uh, I believe in federalism, if it allows to conduct, you know, better uh, social uh, fiscal policies at the national level, and I think it can. So, you know, I am a federalist, I voted yes in, in both referendums, 1992 was my first vote, I was 21 years old, and, you know, okay, you know, I voted yes. But, you know, at the same time, I think we have to take seriously what this, what this is telling us. What this is telling us is that, you know, there's a major class cleavage that has been developed over the years over uh, European integration. And, you know, I think one part of the explanation, in my view, uh, has to do that the logic of, you know, competition, generalized competition between countries, between regions, between territories, between individuals on which Europe is built with, you know, free... Uh, exchange of goods and services, free capital flows without any substantial common uh, fiscal policy, common redistribution of any sort. In the end is, you know, the kind of, of sort of social dumping, fiscal dumping, environmental dumping that's going on within, within Europe and at a more global level, even more so obviously, but, but in particular within Europe is, um, is, you know, making, you know, basically lower uh, class or lower middle class uh, individuals, you know, feel that this system is working to the uh, largest benefit of the most mobile individuals, the most uh, educated, the higher wealth, higher income, social groups, 
the bigger corporations as compared to small and medium-sized corporations. And, you know, this perception, I think, uh, you know, sometimes might be exaggerated, but by and large does correspond to a reality. So I think if we don't manage to address this uh, structural problem, you know, this will continue. And, and we will not, this, this is not going to go away. This is not something that's going to go away. And, you know, the view that, you know, the, you know, the other view will be, okay, there's nothing we can do about it, you know, lower class or middle class voters are structurally uh, more nationalist, more xenophobic, less internationalist. To me, you know, it's the worst possible conclusion or attitude that one can have because there's obviously no natural reason of any sort why, you know, the bottom group should be, uh, you know, more uh, nationalist than the elite or, you know, this, and there are lots of instances uh, across histories where the opposite uh, uh, happen, you know, in my uh, post-electoral survey from the 50s, 60s, I have questions about, you know, how do you feel with the French uh, colonial empire, should we keep the empire, should we have independent countries, and I mean, I can tell you that upper income groups in France were more in favor of colonization than lower income groups, so because, you know, independence at the time uh, came with, uh, uh, you know, communist, internationalist mobilization. So anyway, all these things are constructed historically through social and political mobilization, and we should not, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentialize and, and naturalize, uh, uh, you know, these attitudes towards the, the, you know, international integration. This is, uh, this depends on how this is constructed collectively. And so, you know, I don't think we can we can take this as granted and 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 you know conclude that nothing can be done. So that's uh, you know I think the first reason to relate inequality to European integration. You know, what can we do if we want just to avoid uh, uh, you know further Brexit and you know further uh, you know major difficulties when we want to hold a, a referendum in a, 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 over over the European issues. But of course, one possibility is you don't hold referendum anymore, and this is what France did since 2005. But you know, I'm, I'm not sure this, this uh, solves uh, the problem. This is sufficient to solve the problem. The, the only reason why I want to link uh, Europe and inequality is that you know there is this widespread perception that Europe is more equal than other world regions, which, so, you know, maybe we should not complain about inequality. And, you know, I think this is partly true that indeed, you know, Europe has made sort of more progress historically toward more equality, but, you know, we should be, we should not exaggerate, you know, the, the achievements and we should be, you know, a bit more cautious about this. So in order to put this into perspective, you know, I'm going to show you a few results from the World Inequality Report 2022, which is a report that we published uh, a few months ago. So this comes from data. So you can see the report online. You know, the full report is available online. This comes from data that we publish. The, you know, we publish new data almost every week in the World Inequality Database. This is a big uh, international consortium uh, with over 100 researchers from all over the world. Uh, so historically, we started with data on uh, the distribution of income, income inequality, and then in the new report, we've moved toward inequality of wealth, gender inequality, and to some extent, environmental inequality. And, you know, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of each of these dimensions and where Europe stands, you know, very, very quickly. So let's start with, with income inequality, which is, you know, the first dimension that we've started uh, uh, measuring in our world inequality database. So here you have a simple indicator, which is the share of total income going to the top 10% of the population. So let's get the orders of magnitudes right. You know, if you had complete equality, the top 10% should have 10% of total income. And if you had complete inequality, the top 10% should have 100% of total income. In the real world, of course, it's always between 10 and 100, as it should be. Uh, in practice, it actually goes from 20, 25 to almost 70 percent in South Africa. So, you know, the most unequal country in the world, according to the data now, is South Africa. It's almost 70 percent of total income to the top 10. Then you have Brazil or Mexico or Chile, where it's 60, 65 percent to the top 10. In Europe, it's indeed more equal in the sense that it's, it will be 25 percent, you know, in Norway or Sweden or 30 percent in France uh, uh, or, or, or Italy or Spain or 30, 35 percent in Germany or Britain going to the top 10 percent. So, yes, Europe, you know, has become more equal. But first of all, as I'm going to show you with other dimensions of inequality, you know, it is still very unequal. 
And next, you know, I'm not, I don't think that, you know, telling European citizens, uh, look, uh, you know, you are, uh, you are more equal than, uh, than South Africa or Brazil or India or the United States, you know, is, is uh, and therefore you should stop complaining and you should be so happy about the European welfare state. You know, I don't think this kind of political rhetoric, which is used a lot, uh, is uh, terribly convincing because I think you know European citizens are aware of that, uh, and uh, this is not their comparison point. Their comparison point is more you know as compared to 20 years ago in Europe, 30 years ago in Europe, and things actually have not been going in the right direction. So, you know, comparing to very very unequal countries on the planet, I, you know, I don't think is the right way to go. Uh, and also, as I was saying, you know, in other dimensions, inequality is still is still very large, including. In fact, you know, if you look for income, so here this is the top 10%. Uh, maybe what's more interesting is the share going to the bottom 50%. So, so by definition, what doesn't go to the top 10 and doesn't go to the bottom 50 goes to the 40% that are in between the top 10 and the bottom 50. So again, let's get the orders of magnitude. You know, if you had complete equality, the bottom 50% should get 50% of total income. If you had complete inequality, it should be zero. In practice, it goes from five to 30, 25, 30. So again, South Africa, it would be 5%. In Nordic Europe, it would be about 25% or a bit more. So when you are 50% of the population and you get 25% of total income, this means that on average, your income is about half of the average income of the country in which you live. So of course, you are poorer than average. You know, after all, you are the bottom 50%, but you are not hugely poorer than average. When your income share is 5%, like in South Africa, you know, it means your average income is only one-tenth of the average income of the society in which you live. So you know, the gaps are enormous. So this also shows why distribution is so important, because you know, if you only look at aggregate GDP or national income per capita, you're going to miss a lot because as you can see, you know, the share going to the bottom 50% can vary from a factor of say one to five, which means that for the same average income in a country, you know, the average income of the bottom 50% can actually vary from a factor of one to five. So if you only look at the aggregate, you know, you're gonna miss a lot about the actual material living condition of a huge group of the population, the half of the population, and, and this has an enormous impact on the poverty rate, etc. So this distribution is important, and you know even if Europe is less unequal than other parts of the world, you can see that you know the bottom 50 percent is still you know 20, 25 percent. This is much less than the top 10 percent, uh, you know which will be 25, 30, 35 percent in Europe in spite of the fact that the bottom 50% is five times more numerous. So it's not as if we live in a world of uh, complete equality. Uh, and it's even worse, you know, so when you look at wealth, so this is now what, you know, what I want to stress is that even though, you know, Europe has made some progress historically uh, during the 20th century in terms of income uh, inequality. So if you were to look to, uh, to at the beginning of the 20th century, maybe I should stress that first, you know, here you have Europe in yellow, you know, with 30, 25, 30% for the top 10%. If you look back to the early 20th century, it will be 50, 60% of total income for the top 10. So it will not be South Africa, but it will be, uh, uh, you know, between Latin America and North America today. So, so you know, that's, there are big variations across country at a given point in time, but there are also big variation over time. So Europe has become more equal in terms of, of income uh, in the course of the 20th century because of major transformation in the, in the legal, uh, social, fiscal, educational system, welfare state, progressive taxation. You know, I'm, I'm not going to have time to get into the details, but what I want to stress here is that this limited progress toward more equality in terms of income uh, has been limited and, and, uh, and, and it's even more limited if you look in terms of wealth. So here, you know, this is the same kind of data, but this is for property ownership rather than income. So income is what you earn during a given year. It can be labor income, capital income. Wealth, property is what you own. So this includes uh, real estate, uh, business assets, uh, 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 you know, financial assets, net of debt. And what you can see is that the concentration of wealth, you know, is very high everywhere, 
including in Europe. So, you know, if you take the, the bottom 50%, again, you know, they would own about 4% of total wealth in Europe. So, you know, this is better. In Latin America, it's only 1%. And in the US, it would be 2%. So, okay, you know, 4% is better than 2% or 1%, but, you know, it's, it's still extreme concentration uh, uh, of, of wealth. And if anything, in recent years, this has, this has become worse. You know, very top wealth billionaire, you know, have been going up. Bottom wealth has been going down. And, you know, with inflation today, you know, it's like a tax on people who have small uh, saving on their saving account. And so this can only make things uh, worse. So, you know, I think again, you know, it would be a big mistake to tell European citizens, okay, you know, don't complain, everything is great. Uh, we also, in the World Inequality Report, uh, provide some new estimates, worldwide estimate of, of gender inequality with this very simple indicator, which is what's the total share of labor income, wage income, self employment income going to women. Um, and you can see that. Uh, if you use this kind of indicator, you know, this gives you a view of gender inequality that is a bit, uh, I think, a bit more realistic and a bit less uh, edulcorate, so to say, than when we look for a given job. You know, because when you look for a given job or a given occupation, you get a gender gap of, say, 10 or 20 percent. But the point is that women don't access the same job and occupation and high paid managerial position. So if you look, in fact, what's the share of women in total wage bill, you know, in Western Europe today, it's going to be 35, 36, 37 percent, you know, which means that men are getting, you know, 64, 65, you know, 63 percent of the total wage bill. So, you know, this gives a sense of a much, uh, you know, much, the bottom line is that we're still very, very far from, uh, from gender parity and in many ways further away than when we look at these other indicators uh, for a given job or for a given uh, for a given occupation. So the choice of indicators, you know, it's a very political uh, choice. It's, uh, it's, uh, and, and, and that's, that's also very important for gender parity. The last piece of evidence from World Inequality Report, which I want to draw your attention to, is for uh, uh, emissions of carbon, uh, carbon emissions. So if you look here at Europe, you know, we, we always talk when we talk about carbon emission at, at uh, uh, inequality between countries, so you know the global north has per capita emissions that are hugely, you know, larger than the global south. That's for sure. But here, what we want to stress is that within the north, within the south, there's also a lot of inequality. So if you take the case of Europe, you know, you take the bottom 50 percent of the European population with the lowest carbon emissions. So here we include the carbon content of imports, of course, as we should. Uh, uh, what you get is uh, is that the bottom 50% European citizen have an average emission of about five tons, which is still too much. You know, this should be reduced to about four, three, two by 2050. But they are not completely out of line with, with you know, the target for, for, for the coming decades. The problem is that the average emission for the top 10% is about 20, uh, 29 tons. And if you were looking to the top 1%, it would be like, when, you know, almost 80 or 90 tons, so, you know, huge, almost 100 tons per capita. So, the, again, here the bottom line is if you, it's going to be very difficult to fight climate change and to reduce drastically uh, uh, carbon emissions if you don't reduce social economic inequality at the same time. You know, if, if you, if you come with a policy, which is a little bit what we, you know, what has been tried in in France and what is being discussed at the European level today, that, that is trying to reduce everybody in a proportional manner through, you know, a gigantic proportional carbon tax or through, you know, an equivalent, uh, uh, you know, extension of the quota system, you know, trying to reduce everybody by 20%, 30%, 40%. You know, I think this is just not going to work. You know, I think people at the bottom who have emission of two, three, four, five tons, are going to tell you, look, uh, you know, I'm ready to make some changes in my life, but first you have to start with people who have emissions of 30, 50, 100 tons. And, and so you have to have some kind of progressive carbon tax. You have to find, have some kind of uh, uh, energy uh, uh, pricing where, uh, where, you know, you have a relatively low price for the first units of energy consumption, and then you increase drastically the price or the tax for people who have higher consumption. But, you know, you cannot treat 
I, you know, in the same manner, people who have emission of three or four tons and people who have emission of 30 or 40 or 100 tons, you know, that's the bottom line. So if you don't, you know, the invention of modern uh, progressive income tax at the beginning of the 20th century was a, a very important uh, innovation in the sort of coming from the 19th century uh, fiscal regime to the 20th century fiscal regime. Well, I think, you know, getting in the 21st century will, will require the invention of other uh, progressive tax instruments, you know, including progressive carbon tax, and I think also uh, progressive taxation of wealth, because, uh, you know, what you own uh, uh, is, in the end, is even more important in terms of control over your own life, general capabilities than your income, and, and as we've seen, there's been very limited progress in terms of, of uh, wealth equality in the, in the long run. So if you want to know more about you know, the, the, sort of this evolution of uh, equality and equality from an historical perspective and how I try to draw lessons from the past to offer perspective from the future, I strongly encourage you to read this book, which is very short. Uh, it's like 250 pages. So you know, I wrote a number of very long books, uh, which you probably have not read and, and uh, you know, they are probably too long and I apologize for this, but you know, this one can be read in a weekend. 250 pages, and you will get you know, the most important uh, uh, ingredient of the of the of the story. Let, let me say, let me come back to the manifesto for the democratization of Europe, and just say you know very briefly how this relates to inequality and what we've just been talking about until now. The core of the you know, manifesto is to, to make a proposal. So by the way, I should say you can sign the manifesto. You know, we have 118,000 signatories. You know, this is not so much, but you know, this is even, you know, this is even smaller than the population of Luxembourg who have a veto right of their taxation decision in Europe. So, you know, we're still, uh, we're still far from, uh, from uh, you know, it's still far from enough, but you know, it's, it's our little contribution to the, to the discussion. You can go to the website uh, and sign it. You can read all the documents. So this is something we put online in 2018. So this is a bit old, and we actually plan to work for you know an updated, extended version before the, the next uh, European parliamentary election of 2023. And, and you know we will try to to propose something that is that is more. Uh, complete, better, you know, in any case, it will always be, you know, very small contribution. So, you know, we don't, they certainly don't believe that, you know, this is a magic bullet that's going to solve everything that would be ridiculous. You know, maybe there's a 1% of the, of the transformation that we need in Europe or 2% of the transformation that we need in Europe are in this manifesto, but, you know, even this one or 2%, you know, I think is, uh, can be useful. So, in a snapshot, you know, what we say is, okay, we need, uh, uh, you know, a subset of European countries, you know, if, if all countries, 27 countries, and even, uh, you know, uh, Britain coming back to the Union one day, uh, Ukraine coming, you know, it's even better, of course, if we have 28, 29. But in the meantime, a subset of Europe, of, 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 of European Union countries, we, we want to have deeper fiscal integration, can sign what we call a treaty of democratization of Europe, where this subset of countries will still be in the European Union with its own institution, which are unaffected by this treaty, but will create you know, separate uh, a set of cooperation, uh, uh, in particular with a European assembly uh, that will be made partly by members of national parliaments and partly by members of the European Parliament. And you know, that's a discussion of how we, you, you know, you want to split the two. We tend to favor a bigger representation of national parliament members because we believe it's very important to involve them in the, in the, in the European process and in the uh, decision over common taxation and common budget. But you know, that's, that can be discussed. And you know, if, if that was to be done, entirely without the national parliaments and entirely with the current existing European parliament, why not? I mean, we, we don't believe this is going to, as this can really happen this way, but you know, we can, we, can, we can discuss about this. In any case, what's important is that this European assembly for the countries that have decided to join it will be able to uh, adopt a number of uh, uh, social policy, fiscal policy together. In particular, they can adopt 
a common uh, uh, taxation of multinationals, common progressive taxation of top income, progressive taxation of top wealth, and progressive taxation of carbon emissions. And this could finance, you know, a joint budget to invest in, in green technologies, in research uh, universities, and also, you know, part of this new uh, 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 of this new uh, uh, tax revenue will, will be redirected to the countries that are part of this uh, of this agreement, and, and they will they will spend it directly. And you know, that's part of the parameters that needs that you know, that will have to be chosen by this uh, European Assembly. So, you know, we I'm not going to get more into the details. You know, on the website we try to give uh, you know we have a number of question and answer and. You know, again, you know, this project is is uh, is not supposed to be perfect. This was done uh, for almost uh, for the three year and a half ago. Uh, we we will, you know, we we have had a lot of discussion with lots of colleagues, lawyers and non lawyers, about this. Uh, you know, but the the general idea is that you know the transformation of the European uh, uh, institutional system, legal system, is something that is too important to be left only for time of crisis. This is too important to be left only to lawyers. You know, and of course, lawyers are a big part of the, of the, of the you know, community uh, that needs to participate to this discussion. And, um, and uh, you know, we will continue going in this direction, trying to see you know, what are the kind of deep structural change in the, in the, in the organization uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Europe that can help Europe you know, play uh, uh, you know, bigger role for the for the reduction of socio-economic inequality. So again, you know, this project is not the magic bullet. But one thing that we are completely sure of is that if we don't have some major structural change, you know, these basic realities that I have shown you at the beginning is not going to go away. And and uh, and one day or another, you know, this will explode in our face once again. And uh, you know. The, we, we just need to talk seriously about this and, and ask really what are the big structural transformations that can help uh, address this. So there are probably many different answers. And you know, the answer we provide is maybe only 1% of the solution or 2% of the solution. But you know, at least let's try, if we all come with our own uh, one or 2%, you know, maybe one day we can, uh, we can try to do something. So thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, I'm going to close this. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Piketty. So I want to open up for questions and comments, but to initiate that, what really struck me is so important in your observations was this link, this connection between inequality, legitimacy um, of the European project. And as somebody who's very interested in working on labor and the EU and regionalism. And what you were saying earlier about over the 20th century, individual European states gradually became more equal, but that was very much a project which took place within the national frame in that to the extent that um, markets were contained, they were contained within national systems of social democracy, social citizenship, welfare states. And I suppose my question in light of what you just said is to what extent is the EU, and to what extent is that containment of capital in order to um, undo inequality possible at the transnational, possible at the European level, in the absence of a democratic legitimacy of the EU? So basically, which comes first? Is it possible for the EU to have the legitimacy to tackle inequality in the way welfare states did in the 20th century? Um, in the in the absence of a buy-in from populations. So I'm just going to um, open up to other questions and comments with, with that, with that um, suggestion. So if you could please raise your hand using the Zoom function and I'll I'll try to I'll look out and call and call upon you. If you could just give us tell us your name and perhaps yeah, your where you're coming from, your affiliation if you have one. So do you want me to answer your question now or we take a few? No, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll give space to somebody else. So I see uh, Wojciech, Professor Wojciech Zdorski with his hand up. Hello, thank you very much, Professor Piketty. I'm, uh, I'm affiliated with the University of Sydney and with the University of Warsaw. 
Uh, and uh, especially my affiliation with Warsaw and therefore my background suggests to me that one of the issues which may be sort of, at least on the face of it, invisible to the project, I hope they are not, uh, are the currently dramatic developments regarding the rule of law, and especially the policing by European institutions, especially the Commission and the Court of Justice, of breaches of the rule of law in a number of states. So my question to you is, in what way are you going to convince defenders of the rule of law in countries such as Poland and Hungary that your project is highly visible, uh, is highly relevant to their own concerns, especially in view of the fact that some of these governments may at least uh, on the face of it endorse issues of combating socioeconomic inequality and common fiscal policy, uh, only if you look the other way when the violations of judicial independence, for instance, are breached. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, we, I'll just take another question from Maria Bartle, Professor Bartle. Thanks, Maria. Uh -huh. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to, to Professor Piketty and thanks to, uh, to Diamond. I have a very small question, namely, could you, could you give us a little bit of background or your, your, your evaluation of why do we see the decrease of a female labor share income in China over the past uh, 10 to 15 years or in the, in the, in the, in the period uh, under examination? So those are two very different questions. I'm going to put them back to you, Professor Piketty. Yeah, well, let me start with the last one, which is a very simple factual question. So the reason this is happening in our data for China is because of the, you know, the rise of the top uh, wages, the top wage share, which started from relatively low level in China back in the 80s and which has increased enormously. And now top wage earners are primarily men, uh, not only in China, but everywhere. So if you look, you know, top 1% or top 5% wages. So other things equal, when you increase, you know, the 1%, the share going to 1%, you actually increase the, the total share going to, to men. Now, in, 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 in other countries, this is counteracted by a stronger effect going on in the middle of the distribution, in the bottom of the distribution, so that overall the share of women increases. But in the context of China, and more generally ex-communist countries, they actually start from a relatively low level of gender inequality and as compared to the West back in, in 1980, 1990. And so the, the, the main change over the recent decades is this big increase at the top. And this is largely a sort of pro-man uh, evolution, if you want. So, so that's what's happening. Uh, which is indeed a bit weird, but, uh, but as you notice on the curve, this is starting from a relatively high level of uh, female share in, in China, I mean, as compared to you know, the West and as compared to the Middle East or whatever. So that was for China. Now, co coming back to, to, to Europe. So let me start with the first question about you know, the, the supranational level and the, you know, the political legitimacy of the supranational level to reduce inequality. You know what, what? What we are trying to do with this with this project uh, is to describe a possible trajectory, a possible institutional and and socio-political path, where you will increase, you know, political legitimacy, democratic legitimacy, at the same time as you increase, you know, the redistributive capacity of the supranational level. But this has to be, you know, a very gradual process. So you know, even in, in our very ambitious project. You know, maybe the you know the supranational level will raise tax revenue of you know somewhere between two or three or four percent of European Union GDP, and you know if if the supranational level demonstrates its capacity to do it well and to do it with a more equitable taxation because you can do it at a broader level, then maybe it will go further. But you know, as compared to the enormous rise of the welfare state at the national level during the 20th century. This is still, you know, relatively small in the sense that the the national uh, welfare state, you know, the, the, you know, has gone from a, you know less than ten percent of national income in total tax revenue in the 19th century and before World War One to 40, 50 percent today. So here we are, we are talking about, you know, an, an increase in in uh, state capacity at the supranational level, which is of 
you know, much more modest magnitude, but this will still be a major uh, transformation. You know, in a way, it's, it, 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 to, it, we have to compare it to something comparable will be, you know, the development of the federal state budget in the United States in the 1930s, before the Great Depression, you know, the uh, uh, federal uh, uh, budget uh, in the US was, you know, very, very well, smaller than state budget. You know, it was less than 5% of GDP, and you know, it went to uh, 10 and 15% of GDP, and it became bigger than, even bigger than the state budget. But you know, in a very different context, Great Depression, World War II, you know, we are not quite there. Uh, but, but so this is a gradual strategy, and, and indeed the legitimacy has to come with the slow development of a political space where we can actually discuss you know, matters of, of uh, uh, you know, redistribution, inequality between social groups, uh, the, the, the distribution of the tax burden across social groups. And, um, and, and that's where also we believe that the, you know, national parliament members, you know, it's important to, to, to have them, uh, um, uh, you know, to have them in the loop. And, and so, you know, one example of what we have in mind is if you think of the French German parliamentary assembly that was created in 2019, which was after our TEDEM. I don't think this was done because of our TEDEM, but anyway, yeah, it, you know, it's a, the big difference is that, of course, the French German parliamentary assembly that was created by a bilateral French German treaty was a purely consultative uh, assembly so far. But you know, the same bilateral treaty could have very well decided to grant uh, this binational parliamentary assembly uh, real decision making power, for instance, to create a joint, a common uh, carbon tax or tax on multinationals and a common budget to invest in a, a university or, or green technology or whatever. And so it's, it's, it, you know, it's not so complicated. And, you know, I think, of course, it would be better to do it with more than two countries, but, you know, the more, the better. But, we, you know, our feeling is that it has to be relatively gradual. It would be very surprising if we can, uh, if we can do it right away over, uh, over uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, 27 countries and over gigantic amounts. Because at the end of the day, you know, also to, to return to your historical question, you know, as we believe, you know, the nation state and also the very local level, municipality level, you know, will you know, always remain, uh, you know, when, when, you know, much more important in many ways than the supranational level to organize the distribution, to organize welfare state, to organize, uh, uh, you know, local public services and, uh, you know, non-profit uh, uh, structure. And, and uh, we, we are not trying to, to you know, to, to promote the view of a sort of gigantic, uh, you know, uh, transfer to the supranational level that that will, uh, that will not make uh, much sense. The question about the rule of law and Poland and and so the way I understand the question is how do you? Well, there are maybe there are two dimensions in the question. How do you convince countries like uh, Poland, you know, to enter this kind of scheme and? Can this kind of scheme also help you do something about, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, how to convince the, some of these governments, you know, to change their attitude towards the, 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 the judiciary and towards the rule of law in general? Well, you know, generally speaking, you know, if you have more resources to distribute, uh, you know, you, you also have more uh, power, you know, to impose your... Uh, you know, your views on various, uh, uh, you know, legal matters and matters about the definition of democracy. And, you know, I think it will also be the opportunity to have, to have stronger rules about what we mean by democracy, you know, including for, for uh, Western European countries and how you finance uh, political campaigns, how you finance the media. I mean, we can always, you know, define stronger rules about what, you know, democratic norms uh, rather than just giving lessons to other countries. And, and you know, I think it's, it's important to, to do it uh, you know, in this more balanced manner. The, the other answer is, as you know, you know some of these anti-liberal government, uh, uh, in particular in Poland, uh, actually care about inequality and you know, have, have, have developed, you know, in some cases, you know, redistributive policy, uh, you know, including a child benefit uh, uh, in Poland, which now you know, uh, liberal parties uh, have to uh, accept uh, that, you know, maybe this was not such a bad idea after all. And, and sometimes, you know, the best uh, liberal party can say is, uh, okay, we will keep it in place if we, if we come back to power. But, you know, if all you have to propose uh, 
if you come back to power is to keep in place what the other people have done, uh, you know, that's, uh, that may not be enough. So, so there's a question of how would we have, you know, even more redistribution, even more social policies in, in, uh, in, uh, in a country like Poland. And, you know, I think this new approach to Europe as a tool to, to have more progressive taxation, to reduce taxation for people at the bottom, in the middle, and to pay it by increased taxation by people at the top can also be a way to, to present you know, Europe very differently from the way it has been uh, portrayed and, and the way it has, it has actually been organized, uh, and which has contributed you know, to create this, uh, this, uh, this, this weird uh, political situation uh, in, in a country like Poland, where you know, the anti-European, uh, anti-liberal party also promotes uh, more redistribution than the pro-liberal and pro-European party, and which is a very weird, uh, uh, situation. So that's, I, I think that's in some ways, this is what, you know, this, this is this contradiction that we are trying to address. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's time for two final questions. I can see hands up from Martijn Hesselink and Andy Woodman. Thank you. So Martijn first. Thank you, Diamond. Thank you uh, for this wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, so the I'm, I'm not, I don't have a clear picture on the, you didn't have any graphs, you didn't present any graphs on um, equality between different European member states and so how inequality in member states maps onto power of the member states, for example. And I was just wondering how your two-speed Europe, and essentially like you, you said it must be gradual, so it would be a true or multi-speed Europe, how that was going to work out would then um, and wealth, sorry, also of the country. So would a coalition, you would expect that the countries that have uh, least inequality would be more willing to, to, to coalesce, even though there would be less in need of it, but they would be coalescing, perhaps, I would think so, because it would be less controversial. Um, and, and would these also be the rich countries or would it be the powerful countries? So how would, what would the implications be? What kind of group would this be, be actually uh, of European countries? And the second question, that was a more empirical one, the other one was, um, do you think there's any way, especially in relation to these different potential power dynamics, to this would be a equality union, if you like, but what would limit those countries, to prevent those countries from otherwise also coalescing and simply having a really a, a two-speed Europe also in other respects and uh, saying, you know, now that we, we, we are joined, we could actually also do the, also do the euro only among, among these, these similar thinking uh, countries. Thank you. Um, just uh, quickly, if you can. Thank you, Andy. Sure, yeah, I'll be quick. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot. It was a great talk. Uh, it's always great to hear critical political economy being talked about in relation to the, to the EU. I think we need more of that. So just two very quick questions then. Uh, firstly, I agree on the need for a, a deep structural transformation of Europe. I was wondering what you thought of the Green New Deal and, and next-gen EU in light of that, because I, to me, they, they don't seem to be offering any real structural transformation and they seem to be within a neoclassical economic framing and not particularly social democratic or, or socialist and related to that I would ask I, I like your framing that you're talking about the democratization of Europe and linking this to economic issues and, and would you agree that um, if we really want to talk about democracy we need to talk about uh, some democratic control over how economic production and distribution uh, takes place thank you yeah so well, th thanks for these great questions I so you know, we could talk for much, much, much longer about, about this. Okay, which countries, you know, could, 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 uh, could join first? So, the, you know, the, the simple and, you know, a bit lazy answer will be, uh, okay, you have to start with, uh, you know, sort of the core uh, uh, Eurozone countries, uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, and, and then we'll see, you know, who wants to come. Now, in practice, you know, it can be more complicated. I think you need to have, you know, at least, uh, you know, these core countries are at least two or three out of these four core countries, ideally the four of them, of course. Then, you know, whether all rich countries are, you know, will join, you know, it's very unlikely because we know that there are some pretty rich countries, uh, including, you know, Sweden, Denmark, uh, or even the Netherlands, which are, which will be quite unlikely to join, uh, at least at the beginning. And, and, you know, you could have some, some poorer countries, you know. You know, including Poland or, or, or in a very different, very different reason, you know, Greece or whatever that would join. So, you know, the, the geography with respect to, to average income or, or to the level of income inequality, you know, could be quite complex because in the end, these are 
sort of political and ideological, historical factors that, that make, uh, may make each country, you know, wants to join. And, you know, this can change very quickly depending on the, uh, you know, the, the political situation in each country. Now, the objective is, of course, that, that all, you know, countries will want to join as, 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 as soon as possible. So, so that, that the objective is not to have a two-speed Europe, you know, for, for uh, forever. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, realistically, uh, we have to, you know, instead, you know, if I compare to the current, you know, uh, French proposal of, you know, telling Ukraine, uh, okay, you're going to wait for several decades before uh, joining the European Union, because, you know, we first want to have a more integrated uh, European Union, or this is the official discourse. But I think it will make more sense to say, let's extend very quickly, you know, the European Union to Ukraine to uh, the Balkan country, etc., and then within the European Union, we have this, this you know, uh, 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 what I call in capital and ideology, uh, European Parliamentary Union, you know, EPU as opposed to EU, that would be more integrated with this European Assembly, uh, and so I, to me, this would be more ambitious than, than you know, telling Ukraine, okay, you're going to wait 20 years, and and we are going to change. The European Union institution first with you know with the 27 countries because I don't think this will happen for the 27 countries. So at the end of the day, you don't have Ukraine in the European Union and you don't have the transformation of the European Union institution. So that that will be the my response. Uh, Green New Deal. I entirely agree with you that it's still, you know, very much uh, yes, neoclassical in spirit and typically, you know, the proposal to extend the quota system for carbon emission. You know, we're still stuck in a view where, okay, you start by taxing everybody, and then you promise that you will redistribute some of it to the poor. But I think this will not work. You know, I think it's a, it will not work because you know this is too this is just too complicated and too uncertain. You know, I think we have to think of an explicitly progressive carbon tax system or non-linear pricing of energy, where you know the poorest groups, you know, don't don't pay more to begin with. You know, the idea is that you're going to make them pay a lot more, but they will be reassured by the fact that you tell them that later on, you know, one or two years later, they will receive indirectly part of the resources. Yeah, I, you know, I think this is just not going to work. Uh, so, so, so here there's a you know, core issue about inequality, uh, which has to be addressed if we want to be able to do something. Uh, uh, I fully agree with you that you know today in this presentation I focused on taxation redistribution, but you know the, the, the question of power, in particular in companies and and you know balance of power between workers' rights and shareholders, you know, is absolutely central. And you know I have I have made proposal in this direction. You know I think extending to to uh, to uh, you know as many countries as possible uh, uh, more uh, more uh, rights for worker representative in board of companies increasing the number of seats uh, bringing more uh, you know consumer association stakeholder in the board of companies reducing the the the, the number the fraction of votes that a single shareholder can have in a large company you know as this has to come together with the more sort of fiscal and monetary redistribution aspects that I was uh, uh, describe. So, uh, I, yeah, I fully agree with what you said. Thank you so much, Professor Piketty, for your response to these questions and for such a generous and provocative start to the conversation we're going to carry on with this journal, and in particular bringing our interest as mostly legal scholars into conversation with, with yours as an economist and political theorist and, and sociologist. So thank you so much and very, very grateful for you coming today to help us uh, launch our journal. Thanks a lot and sorry that I have to leave and uh, yeah, have a you know, long life to European Law Open. You know, this is very impressive what you've done and you know, I, I'm sure I will read the, a lot of what you publish. And so thanks a lot for you know, inviting me to this discussion. Bye-bye. Thank you, thanks Bye. so much. Okay, so, um, I want us to move straight on now to the second part of our launch today. Uh, we're going to hear from Professor, Professor Stephanie Hennett um, and Professor Antoine Vacher. Professor Hennett is Professor of Law at the University of Paris Monterre and Senior Member of the Institut Université de France, which is um, a title distinction conferred on a very small number of university professors for their research excellence, in particular in this case international recognition. Professor Nett's research lies in the field of human rights theory, broadly understood, 
with particular focus on bioethics, the sociology of human rights law, fem feminism, gender equality, and laicite and religious freedom. Her most recent book is uh, The Cambridge Companion to Gender and the Law, which is, which is forthcoming later this year. Today, she's going to be talking about freedoms, rule of law, and states of emergency. We'll also hear from Professor Ant Antoine Rochaud. He's research professor at the University of Paris, Paris Sorbonne, and also Nico Andre is visiting professor for this academic year at the Hertie School his, uh, in Berlin. His research engages with the field of historical sociology, political sociology, and critical sociology of law, researching extensively the interactions between forms of expertise, transnational knowledge communities, and transnational politics, with a particular emphasis on law, economics, and European Union policy. Um, he's, he's recently completed a series of three books on law, politics, and democracy in the European Union, including a monograph, Brokering Europe, Euro Lawyers and the Making of Transnational Policy. And his most recent publication is on the neoliberal republic, corporate lawyers, statecraft, and the making of public-private France. Today, Professor Bachot will be talking about EU policy and the notion of publicness, what we understand by public. So I'll hand over now to Professor Hennett and Professor Bachot to uh, decide which order you're going to speak in. Yeah, th thank you, Diamond. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to be uh, starting, and, and first let me say that I too am absolutely thrilled to be here. I'm very impressed with the uh, first issue of the European Law Open, and I'm looking forward to contributing in the future. And I, I really want to really congratulate all the team that has been working behind the scenes to make this happen. I just wanted to start by uh, maybe trying to link a little bit Thomas's, uh, Thomas Piketty's talk with mine and, and Antoine's in a minute. Uh, as as uh, Thomas has recalled, uh, he, Antoine, and I have worked together for uh, a couple of years after 2017 on the TDEM proposal, the Manifesto for the Democratization of Europe. And of course, this proposal was largely an intervention, and indeed one that was initiated in the 2017 presidential campaign in France. But it was, of course, an intervention by academics. And I guess that the three keywords for today's events, inequalities, freedoms, and publicness, echo topics and issues that each of us have been uh, working on. So Thomas's work on uh, inequality has led him to reflect on the ways to better the impact and relevance of fiscal and budgetary uh, tools within the EU for alleviating uh, inequality gaps. Antoine has been interested in the ways in which such objectives could benefit from an increased centrality and better articulation of the importance of public values and goods in European democracy. And I myself have sought to explore uh, some pathways by which a number of crises uh, in the EU or at the European level uh, more generally have been addressed by means of circumventing ordinary rules of mechani or, and mechanisms. And, and this has led me to, to further some thoughts on norm and exception, and which is the, 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 um, the line of argument that I would like to, to share with you today. Um, as I've been pursuing some work on the big trends in a number of political responses to situations of crisis and emergency, um, which of course uh, we largely live in uh, in these days, not only in Europe, of course. Uh, in, the, in Europe, of course, we immediately think of the 2008 uh, financial crisis or the 2015 so-called migration crisis, and of course we're still uh, somewhat in the midst of the uh, pandemic crisis. But I think we also need to keep in mind more structural and creeping elements of crisis. Uh, for example, the ways in which issues of security, counterterrorism, surveillance have uh, gained an importance, of course, since 9-11. Uh, or also, of course, and Wojtek was uh, uh, referring to this, the ways in which uh, there's a huge tension with respect to rule of law standards with the uh, leaders and policies in countries like Hungary and Poland, uh, begging the question of the EU's ability to affirm and impose a number of uh, standards of fairness, pluralism, tolerance, et cetera. So all these situations of crisis, I think, for, for legal scholars raise at least two different sets of issues. Uh, one is substantive and looks at the ways in which freedoms, human rights, seem to increasingly become an adjustment factor in the political responses to crisis as austerity or security or sanitary uh, policies and objectives 
are affirmed, often at the expense of uh, human rights and freedom. But another set of issues that I want to be discussing is more structural and pertains to the fact that oftentimes, and possibly increasingly, the solutions to contemporary challenges, be they economic, securitarian, sanitary, or climatic, these solutions seems to often be found not in normal existing procedures and frameworks, but in ad hoc ones. Ordinary, normal, legal, and political frames and mechanisms tend to be dodged and set aside and preference that's given to special temporary or derogatory measures. So of course, there's a lot of literature addressing all or part of this issue in uh, several specific policy domains. Uh, think, for example, of the very important contribution of uh, Kim Shepley and Ariana Vadasky in the field of uh, the, war, the global war on terror and the ways in which it has transformed the nature and indeed substance of international law, international law being um, requiring that states equip themselves with counterterrorism policies, even if uh, the threat of terrorism is only very remote to them. Uh, whereas before it used to be uh, a limiting or at least oversight factor uh, in, in, in um, making sure that states address both uh, the threats and preserve rule of law standards and human rights. So that's just one example, but of course uh, we can all think of the ways in which the EU financial crisis was um, addressed by solutions outside and parallel to the EU existing treaties same thing with the migration crisis where uh, the directives that existed and have had provisions for uh, extraordinary uh, influx of people were not triggered and rather we went through uh, the EU Turkey deal or hotspots that were invented and then only afterwards legalized. Only to mention that uh, last example in the pandemic, uh, most of the countries have decided to trigger a uh, state of emergency. So all these examples and, and maybe others beg in my view an important question with, resp with respect to what it means to have legal rules in the first place and indeed to affirm rule of law standards because one may want to ask why and how it is acceptable or problematic to set them aside when situations of crisis and emergency arise. So many of us legal scholars work on, on several or, or all aspects of democratic backsliding if we want to you know, just use that uh, umbrella word. And, and what I wanna do today is suggest that there might be one way of unifying uh, the perspective of all of us who are interested with respect to economic crisis, pandemic, uh, migration crisis, terrorism, et cetera. So unify the perspective by paying attention, documenting and deconstructing a number of semantic tricks that are conducive to backsliding. And in other words, I just wanna recall the importance of the fact that law is maybe not only, but necessarily a language. And that despite the importance of a number of epistemological turns from legal realism to theories of law as acts of speech to more interdisciplinary law and context approaches that have invited us legal scholars to be modest about what legal rules actually mean or can do, there are some gross forms of capture and co-optation of core rule of law concepts that ought to be documented and critiqued as such. Now, in light of the permanent crisis mode that seems to have contributed to processes of democratic backsliding, I would like to refer to the specific stakes associated with the rhetoric of the exception. And the main idea or concern that I would like to share is the following. I fear that what I will call the internalization of the exception might be corrupting a number of what we routinely think of as rule of law standards. And here I will rely mostly on some ideas that I de develop in a forthcoming paper on um, the normalization of uh, gov uh, government by emergency uh, paradigm. So of course the issue of the format and modalities of political powers response to situations of crisis has been discussed since ancient times. It has predominantly been addressed through the lens of the state of exception that largely dominates the historical and theoretical literature. And there's, of course, a lot of historical references and the theoretical main contribution, of course, or the dominant one is the Schmittian uh, theoretical concept of state of exception that is essentially articulated around the idea of a suspension of the legal order 
that can be uh, decided by the sovereign in face of a situation of emergency. Now, of course, this idea that the state's response to a situation of crisis or emergency actually lies outside or beyond the legal order is difficult to square with the rule of law paradigm that has, been, that has risen during the second half of the 20th century to the point of becoming coextensive to liberal constitutionalism. And because it presupposes that all state action conforms to legal rules and standards, this rule of law paradigm has threatened the notion that democracies rather honor themselves by responding to exceptional circumstances through regular or ordinary means and should indeed strive towards responses to emergencies that remain within the rule of law framework. Hence the multiplication of rules and documents expressing this internalization of the exception. So now in like nine um, countries out of 10, it is the constitution itself that has specific emergency provisions, not to mention the fact that many international bodies or indeed EU or Council of Europe bodies provide states with sort of checklist, checklists on how to concile emergencies and human rights and rule of law uh, standards. However, I worry that this ambition of the rule of law to effectively tame the exception and constrain the ways in which governments address situations of crisis might be a deceptive rhetoric. Now, of course, a very important voice that has been claiming that this is a deceptive rhetoric would be that of Giorgio Agamben, uh, who claims that the rule of law has not tamed the exception and that indeed we uh, contrarily live in an age of permanent and global state of exception. And of course, this is a very powerful claim, but also one that I think overlooks a crucial aspect of contemporary modes of government in the face of crisis and emergency, namely the fact that rather than rely on the suspension of legal rules, contemporary emergency powers tend to be intensely juridical. In the face of contemporary crisis, legal rules and guarantees continue to operate. There is deliberative rulemaking, there is judicial review, et cetera. And in fact, their being subjected to the rule of law is crucial in terms of emergency powers, legitimacy and acceptability. Hence the pervasiveness of legal and political actors discourses that make the effort of justifying the use of such extraordinary power by insisting on the fact that they are indeed compatible with or indeed necessary for the rule of law. And there are many explanations of this, but I think, and I will end with this last idea, I think that here is where lies a potential danger, as this rhetoric of rule of law compliant emergency regimes can be critically analyzed as a factor of semantic corruption of the rule of law. This is, uh, I think it is important for us as legal scholars to address the ways in which emergency regimes and powers that used to be addressed through this suspension of the legal order going outside the law uh, are now claiming the mantle of legality to speak in the words of David Dysonhaus. And I think this is uh, uh, a, a move that if we look, uh, when we look in depth at the ways in which situations of crisis are really addressed, we can see that the uh, claim of being compliant with rule of law standards doesn't really resist in-depth analysis. So we can all think in different regimes that we know uh, of the ways in which rule of law is being uh, is facing a lot of shortcomings in situations like this. I referred earlier to the migration crisis. Think of the ways in which uh, the Court of Justice refused to examine, uh, or it was impossible to actually have judicial review of this agreement. Uh, we, I referred to the financial crisis. Think of the ways in which the Court of Justice is failing to actually exercise judicial review of decisions taken by the European Stability Mechanism, for example. Uh, I referred to the many states of emergency that have de developed in the face of the pandemic. And I, for example, have done a, a relatively in-depth examination of uh, judicial review of state of emergency measures in France. And here again, we can see that there is really a failure of uh, courts to really uh, exercise strong judicial review. So I really think that uh, all these multiplications of situations of crisis uh, should really be uh, taken by us as an invitation to think of what it does to the rule of law 
to have this uh, generalization, not only of emergency powers, but also of emergency powers that claim to be rule of law compliant. Thank you very much, I'll end here. Thank you so much for that. That's really interesting and challenging, uh, different way of looking at this area of um, emergency, the permanent state of emergency. And I particularly like your example from economic policy governance, because not just in the context of responding to the sovereign debt crisis, we see the emergence of all kinds of non-law, but the everyday background form of regulation is, is a form of non-law because it seems to be uh, shielded from judicial scrutiny. And that's something I hadn't occurred to me before, but so thanks so much for that insight. I want to hand over now to uh, Professor Vesho. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Um, so yes, in um, also, I would also li like to <clears throat> um, explain or present a sort of ram another ramification uh, deriving from uh, uh, are engaging with this uh, treaty of democratization, um, which and on my part um, entailed an interest also in the notion of, of public uh, that of course we kept encountering as we were uh, drafting a treaty uh, that included an EU, an EU budget uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, proposals for the financing of public goods, uh, the creation of a common public debt and of course, uh, the idea of progressive uh, uh, forms of taxes. So as um, I, I was encountering this, uh, this grammar of the public uh, increasingly, I, I, I thought it would be interesting uh, to engage more on, on that uh, in, in the context of the EU. And I, I, in a way, I think this is also what is interesting in uh, trying to make public interventions in a way is that they also lead to more research in the end, uh, which, uh, which uh, after all is what we uh, do the most uh, together. So uh, that led me also to, so to get an interest in, uh, so how the procedures through which a public interest might be identified in the European context, and also the ways through which a European public uh, is identified and, and in the name of which these uh, public policies uh, are uh, uh, conducted. So of course, I admit this is a very ambitious uh, topic, uh, very broad and probably excessively broad for, uh, for this uh, 15 minutes uh, talk. Uh, but I thought it also is a very the sort of broad interdisciplinary uh, type of topic that uh, may be of interest to uh, uh, the European law open um, uh, community. And I also have to ask for your uh, indulgence uh, in presenting these notes, because after all, I guess the, the month of June always end up, ends up being the most uh, <clears throat> busy uh, month of the year. So uh, I ask also for your audience, uh, in, in this uh, in this presentation. So. My first uh, point is about uh, the, the constat of, uh, of the fact that there is a, a strong return of the lexicon of the public in the context of the EU over the past decade. Um, a, a surge that of course is connected to the way the EU has been led to address a number of crises and emergencies, uh, of course, uh, uh, starting with the pandemia, but also with the uh, uh, Greek uh, transition challenge or emergency, and also now very recently uh, the, the war in Ukraine and the possibility of also of engaging and, and, and building uh, European funds uh, uh, for uh, defense uh, at the European level. Um, I think this public turn in a way uh, turns around very much around the notion of public investment, uh, which in a way, of course, moves the EU a little bit beyond its role as regulator of markets or guardian of the stability of uh, the EU. And of course, this is a story that still has to be told, but moving from the Juncker plan to the uh, projects of Green New Deals to next generation EU, there's a whole discussion uh, about uh, uh, promoting the role uh, of public intervention, um, which of course we have to say that as a starter uh, is a, a, dif a marked difference uh, with the way with which the EU has addressed the financial crisis of the years 2010s. 
uh, where to the contrary, in a way, the sort of uh, uh, EU response to the financial crisis was increased pressure to reduce public intervention, particularly uh, among uh, uh, member states. So uh, with that uh, uh, turn uh, of public investment and discussion around public investment, I think there has been a reopening of a variety of debates. Uh, of course, one on the public debt uh, uh, contracted by institutions, uh, of possibly new functions for EU budget, uh, the prospect of developing uh, uh, public taxes to finance all of that, and of course, a sort of broad political discourse of the so-called or supposedly Hamiltonian moment of uh, transformation of Europe. Uh, so connecting in a way this budgetary efforts to uh, sort of broad political transformation. So I think there is uh, indeed a lot of talk and more talk about public intervention. The EU is of course, uh, part of a, a wider uh, transformation. Of course, the Biden uh, plans uh, are also uh, part of this return of public investment, but there is something specific to the EU. And this is my second point. Uh, this specificity of the EU is somehow that we are in a way rather unprepared uh, when it comes to um, uh, the notion of uh, justifying what the public is. Um, and this is what I'm going to uh, present now. I mean, I think in a way, the EU still lacks a, a, a sort of robust notion of the public and a robust ecology uh, of the public. So what do I mean by ecology of the public? I mean a system of knowledge, of institutions, of professions that specifically discuss, recognize, and promote a common sense of what is the public good at uh, the European uh, level. I think one indicator of this weakness of uh, the ecology of the public at the EU level is the sense of vagueness that one finds uh, when we talk about public goods uh, of European level. Um, the discussion somehow ranges from very broad metaphorical definition of public goods as being any sort of collective objective given to a given political organization, um, to a very narrow uh, mainstream economy, apolitical definition of public goods uh, as, you know, uh, following the, the famous criteria of non excludability and non rivalry of these uh, uh, specific forms of goods. Um, one other element, uh, relatedly, is that there is a, a difficulty to define what, are, what is European. Uh, what are the European public goods as, as somehow opposed to national, local, and global ones? <clears throat> most, often, most often than not, I think think tanks of e EU institutions um, uh, define public goods in strictly economic terms, uh, essentially as providing economy of scale, as, provi as, as balanced, as a providing a sort of net advantage vis-a-vis -vis the local, vis-a-vis -vis the national, uh, as a sort of uh, added value in economic terms. I think one classic calculator of that is the cost of non-Europe that has a sort of story ever since the mid eighties in the context of the EU and the Cecchini report of somehow uh, calculating the public interest uh, of EU uh, intervention or if you public intervention through this sort of bureaucratic mode of calculation. So I think Overall, what we see in this <clears throat> is that the grammar of justifying public, European public goods remains pretty thin overall. And of course, uh, bureaucratic uh, in the sense that this procedure of revelation are essentially bureaucratic and uh, somehow strikingly disconnected from all the efforts that have gone in parallel, have developed in parallel to build political and civic justifications for the EU. And some of them, of course, being entrenched in the treaties. And of course, one could refer to Article 2 uh, of the Treaty of the European Union, but also more broadly to all the constructs around notions of democracy and citizenship that are actually never mentioned or almost never mentioned when uh, justifications of the public goods are actually brought forward. So, I mean, I don't want to and don't have the time to engage here in, uh, uh, in 
identifying sorry all the reasons for this weak ecology or thin ecology of the public in the context of the EU, but I can at least mention two that are, of course, very well known to all of you. One of the one of them being the fact the the fact that uh, the EU has historically developed as a public fabric of private markets. So uh, from the common market, of course, and they were up until the banking union, uh, in a way the institutional, uh, the, the specific political model of the EU is to be a public fabric of uh, uh, private markets, which means that the public language that has autonomized around EU institutions or at the periphery of the EU institutions is a public language that actually is anchored in private market obligations. We can still see that, of course, in the way the commission finds or regulates digital companies uh, today in, when, they, you know, when they present risk in terms of data protection or privacy, which of course are grounded in their market obligations and not as a response to public values. Or another example of that, very different, is citizens' initiatives in the sense of media pluralism in, in, in the 2010s that actually had to adopt the language of market and claim that media pluralism was a way to avoid abuse of market position. So in a way, this is well known to many, to all of you, of course, uh, the language of the market remains the language of, Europe, of Europe's public interest. Another reason for that weakness of the ecology of the public is the continued failure of Europe's constitutional imaginary and uh, uh, to realize and to somehow transform market integration into uh, a political community. I think there's a very good paper by Neil Walker um, uh, and a friend, of course, of uh, um, European Law Open, uh, which is precisely identifies this difficulty of the EU to move from being uh, an organization that promotes many public goods to becoming, uh, to metabolize in a way in an organization that actually is uh, uh, um, uh, producing a common sense of European public goods singular. So now, uh, 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 now that somehow very briefly I have uh, identified, you know, this public turn uh, uh, or the return of public lexicon uh, around EU institutions, and also uh, the specific difficulty, I think, that we faced uh, connected to uh, the weak or thin ecology of the public at the EU level. I would like to move on in very few minutes I have left. Uh, in a third point, which in a way is a way to position ourselves in that story, uh, how um, uh, do we uh, EU scholars um, um, enter this picture um, <laughs> related to, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, situation of the public in, in the context of the EU? So I think uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's of course interesting to engage uh, in a sort of history of our discipline, uh, the way the field of European studies has been a unique laboratory for doctrines that uh, thematize uh, a move beyond the public-private divide. I think uh, the EU, uh, EU studies have been probably one of the most lively uh, field of scholarship in terms of providing theories, rationales, and values for uh, 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 overcoming uh, precisely or blurring the lines between the public uh, and the private. I think uh, uh, it could be told about political science because some of the core concepts of EU political science are, uh, of course, notions of integration, notions of governance that explicitly try to overcome uh, uh, conceptions of politics that are uh, conceived around the notion of the public. Um, and also, uh, of course, of EU law for which um, as my colleague uh, uh, Ségolène Segun, barbou Place has nicely shown, uh, the notion, the, 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 the dividing line between public and private has never made its way uh, in, in the field of, uh, of EU public law, or not, never as a summa divisio 
as it is in uh, uh, member states. Um, EU law, of course, is neither private nor public or half private and half public in a way, but uh, as, uh, as, as you know, uh, uh, driven by a mission and still somehow uh, 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 encapsulated in that uh, uh, overall project. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, this, uh, the, the, the field of EU uh, studies uh, leaves us a little bit uh, uh, without a strong uh, dividing line between uh, the public and the private. And in a way that leaves policymakers, activists, social movements, uh, that may push for a European public uh, without a very rich archive of theories, of uh, uh, rationales and, and values when it comes to justify uh, or legitimize a claim to defend a, a European uh, public. I think uh, there are many social movements or coalitions of interest today that uh, em emerge around this notion of public. Let me just quote very briefly a couple of them. One I remember, of course, was a civil servants from the commission uh, 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 engaging a petition uh, when uh, uh, Barroso uh, moved uh, to Goldman Sachs and uh, extending the petition to a more 100,000 signatures uh, among the European public in the name of the public integrity of EU civil servants. But we could also think about uh, um, the campaigns in uh, trade agreements to avoid private in investment tribunals and a sort of coalition of governments, social movements, uh, um, uh, NGOs to uh, maintain, uh, defend, you know, uh, the public, the capacity to regulate of states. And of course, we could move on to many more movements of that. So I think uh, there is a, a thematization of the notion of public, uh, public regulation and public autonomy which is a, a sort of a value and I uh, to, to protect in a way. And um, I um, think uh, in the context of European studies, particularly in the context in which um, the overarching agenda of integration has been, of course, overcome by uh, uh, and is leaving um, many uh, scholars and many sub-disciplines of European studies in a state of désoeuvrement to talk like uh, uh, Loïc Azoulay, so without a sense of a mission uh, that is somehow driving uh, uh, the scholarship, I guess uh, a public turn uh, in uh, uh, European studies could be, of course, uh, an interesting research agenda to, uh, uh, to pursue, I think, of each one of the discipline. And uh, I think, of course, of, um, of uh, history, sociology, uh, law and political science. I'm already over time, so I don't go into detail to how uh, this research agenda could be in a way transformed into looking for uh, the ways in which and the concept through which the public has been or it can be envisioned in the European context. But I guess I leave it to, to, the, to the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Professor Rochelle. So that was for me really Intriguing in that you were just reminding us that the EU has projects always been one about public ordering of private economic activity. So it's it's false to say there's a distinction, but in fact, that the public ordering of that private activity was necessary to force markets into being, or rather to force into being a single market. But this was all taking place whilst lacking a clear account of public. And I'm just interested in whether your project with Professor Piketty and Professor Hennett is, is very much part, is from that will emerge a way of talking about a new, given a new account of public. Um, so I just like to now open it up to discussion and questions um, on both papers. So if you could um, use the raise hand function to alert me to the fact that you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment. I can see Maria has her hand up. Uh, thanks so much. Um, this is one, two wonderful presentations. Uh, uh, well, you know, because I am myself very much preoccupied with the concepts such as public and collective. So I will address the, 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 the question to Anton. So in a way, the way you present, uh, you know, the, the, the EU as you basically, you know, 
public containment of private market. You know, you have you know you have opposition between public and private. But the examples that you give of you know the mobilizations which have somehow you know showed us a different kind of Europe, very much related to society. So they are you know they are social mobilization. So in, in some ways, what has been missed thing in Europe is, you know, we have had a lot of public, so the bu bureaucracy was there, we have had the market and private actors, but we had very little of kind of social glue or, you know, so, you know common collective cause for action uh, that, you know, would actually, yeah, that would not be either, you know, making money or, or governing uh, the, the, the money production process. So, I mean, there is society there. And now I sound like, like a German scholar, I think. I apologize about that. Uh, you know, this is a kind of comment that I could hear Hans Mikl is asking, but um, there, so where is the society in your account? Let's take a couple more questions. I can see Augustin and Daniela. So, oh, Augustin. I'm, I'm switching on the micro. So thanks a lot for a very challenging uh, further uh, questions put on the table. Um, three very short questions, one to each and one to the to the to the project, so to say that um, is behind all presentations of this afternoon. Uh, the first to Stephanie, um, not 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 so much a question, but a curiosity, uh, so to say, in in legal terms, because I cannot more than agree with the ultimate risk that you were pointing to, which is uh, that uh, not only we breach the law, but we pretend that we are complying with the law. And I think this is something that is not the first time that it, it happens. Carl Schmidt, the Führer defends the law, is the ultimate paradigmatic example of this kind of uh, rhetorical strategy. Uh, but in the post-war period, so to say, uh, this is something, and this is the curiosity, would you agree or would you disagree that a clear defining moment was the war on terror uh, in many ways? Uh, because there we have uh, the attempt uh, very obviously to juridify torture uh, as such. And I think uh, we are not uh, sufficiently conscious about the systematic effect that this has had not only the US, but also in Europe. For example, we are discussing, and rightly so, the problems with the rule of law in Poland, in Hungary. Uh, we have not been discussing the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights about secret, secret prisons and about uh, torture, and this has been decided by the European Court of Human Rights. So it's amazing that uh, European scholarship uh, at the national, at the supranational level, was not really attentive uh, to that because this was a very dark uh, moment in many ways. Uh, the other question uh, to uh, Antoine, uh, in in a way, trying to apply uh, the, the the strategic shift uh, that Stephanie is individuating to the question of the public. To what extent, thinking, for example, about the recovery and resilience. Uh, facility, to what extent are we not seeing a cooptation of the rhetoric of the public uh, as such? Uh, leaving aside many of the, let's be very polite, uh, communication strategies uh, of the Commission regarding recovery and resilience, like the amount of money that is on the table, which is much lower than the ones that is announced because Germany will never be asking for loans, so it's not 750 billion, there will never be 750 billion. But leaving that aside, there is this emphasis on public investment that then is not uh, at all uh, matched by the reality on the ground. What we, we are seeing is more the facilitating state uh, that is uh, supporting private investment uh, initiatives uh, as such. Uh, so are we not uh, seeing uh, a bit, a bit of that, sadly enough, and I'm not a nostalgic of the big state uh, as such, and perhaps there are no reasons to be nostalgic of the big state, uh, but uh, the idea of public investment in a decentralized, genuinely social cooperative way and this kind of stuff we could imagine, 
and there is also no reason why uh, in terms of uh, between multinational corporation of public investment, public investment uh, is not best. Another example is uh, vaccination uh, and the, the extent to which public money was put at the use of private research and then we were buying still the vaccines. So uh, it's a very strange way in which this was made into a public good through private profit. And then the question that is addressed, uh, and I can only do it uh, short because if not, it takes years uh, to pose, is the question of reform or rupture uh, that is underlying your project since you uh, were uh, in a way uh, uh, pushing uh, for it and making it, it, uh, making it public. I would say that to me, it sounds subjectively reformist, objectively rupturist in many ways. And it's perhaps unavoidable that there's an element of rupture because what we realize, and it's not only from the left uh, or the traditional social democratic left, if there is any left on that left, uh, but even from Christian social left, if also there is anything left, that any program, you have, for example, elections on Sunday, we don't know the result, even if we can speculate about it, but it noop, which I think I pronounce correctly, I don't know, noop, noopes, whatever. If noop were to win the elections, the program uh, will be clashing immediately uh, with European law. Then the idea of selectively disobeying uh, may be, uh, uh, naive, or maybe uh, some some colleagues will call it infantile, or or whatever the whole concept of uh, disobedience. But the objective problem is there, and the impression that I had reading uh, what you you were proposing is that the, the, you are torn uh, between that. Uh, you, you you were saying, for example, that at some point I remember very vividly uh, that these are reform proposals that we want to put, even if they do not stand an immediate chance of being realized, it's very important that they are made. Uh, and at the same time, you are conscious of the need of doing something, whether you call it renegotiating the treaties or whether you call it breaking selectively with the treaties, does not change the fact that we have to introduce this change. And I think this, this is, the, is, is the challenge and we are also torn. It's, it's not that I'm addressing this as external to the uh, in between uh, these these two positions. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. I saw uh, Daniela Caruso. Yeah. Yes, Daniela. Uh, there is so much on the table. Why don't we hear the responses now? And I will keep my question if there is time okay. after we hear. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So if we turn to you, um, Stephanie and Antoine for your responses. Thanks. Maybe I'll go first. Um, just to well, uh, uh, thank uh, Agustin uh, for, for your, your comment. I, I just want to add a couple of, of things. I think I, I really agree with you. I think that what I'm trying to point at is the, uh, the importance and relevance it might have for us as legal scholars to look not, you know, not to be naively surprised at the fact that it's possible to do terrible things with law or in legal terms or in the legal language, because we've known that for quite some time. But really to try to wonder at the change that might be taking place when terrible things are done with the legal language in the name of the rule of law or in the name of paradigms or mechanisms that it is claimed are rule of law compliant. And in that perspective, I certainly agree that the, the war on terror is, um, is a sort of paradig paradigmatic change globally. And in fact, I just want to, I wanted to mention it earlier, but I didn't have time. I think a really interesting contribution in that respect is a, is a 2018, I believe, book by uh, Bernard Harcourt, uh, who wrote, um, the book is called The Counter-Revolution, How America when it Went at War with Its Own Citizens. And it's a, it's a book really on the US in, in which he, he argues that the counter-insurgency paradigm that used to undergird uh, the American government's strategy in countries like Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, has now taken hold over domestic law and policies in the US. So it's really a book on the US, but what I find really interesting is that according to him, uh, what is really new in what he calls the counterinsurgency paradigm is its legal dimension. He really works exactly on what you're saying. Uh, torture is being 
you know, revamped in, in, in legally compliant ways, or so is extrajudicial killings. And so what really he's uh, directing our attention to is really the ways in which governments are using the law to turn in his um, expression is, is to turn their own illegalisms into legalities. And I think we that, that there's something of a tension here that is extremely uh, interesting. And as you said, I mean, we can all think in, in all our, our various domains of interest and specialization of examples, right? So ECHR law scholars will think of, you know, maybe the proceduralization of um, the control of the European court, or, you know, I mean, anyone can have a host of examples. But what, what I was trying to suggest is, is the extent to which it might be really important for us to sort of adopt a more a uh, unifying conceptual approach, try to grasp all of that as one movement and try to really question what it does to the to the basic, you know, concepts and categories that we've been so accustomed to working with. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, so merci um, for all these questions. Um, and I wish we were in person to continue the discussion longer. Um, but sometime it will happen, I know, so I wait for that moment uh, for longer answers. But uh, but very briefly, I think, yes, uh, what I've been, uh, what I'm trying to say in a way is that in a context with this, this <clears throat> all these big words of, 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 um, of, um, of distribution, of public investment, of budget are coming back somehow on the table. Indeed, we need um, a, th a thicker concept of the public, of the European public. Uh, we need in the sense that um, to, um, uh, to somehow uh, be able to uh, hold institutions you know, in control in a way of the usage that they make of their public claims or of their, of their claims of following or um, um, uh, promoting uh, a, a European public interest. So up until we don't have this uh, thick notion of the European public, uh, uh, um, both in terms of a figure of the European society in the name of which uh, we act and also of the European public interest, then somehow citizens and civil society is somehow disarmed in its criticism of EU you know, institutions. So in my sense, if we want to avoid the sort of public washing, uh, if you want, that, that, that you, were, you were mentioning, um, Augustine, um, in a way, um, th this is the sort of investment we have to do and to avoid the sort of bureaucratic capture of the European public that is, of course, has a long history in the EU, but is somehow strengthened by these new uh, recovery plans, which are not only the EU bureaucracy, but also very much the national bureaucracies that somehow uh, in transnational networks are the ones managing these plans uh, very much at distance from the democratic public. So in that sense, I think we, we, we need, I mean, that's why I really believe we really need to uh, get back on that notion. Um, and we, uh, uh, as a very brief answer also to, to uh, what uh, Maria, we were saying, I think, Indeed, we still uh, lack a, socio a good social. I mean, sociology has been very much the junior partner in European studies, you know. And if we want to understand, and and and, and uh, I mean, I can quote one very good book, um, a Class Sociale en Europe, which is a, a first attempt by uh, three colleagues of mine. I will put the the, the book reference in the in the chat uh, of building a sort of social space of Europe that is not exclusively. A, a sort of interstate um, a, a social space, but also a social space of classes or social groups, uh, which of course is a way to understand uh, the public and its differential exposition to um, you know, public policies of the EU uh, in terms of inequalities of all sorts. So, and, and then in that sense, we need more research uh, and we mean in particular in, in the field of sociology, but also in other fields. So, um, uh, voila. Thank you. Um, should we come back to Daniela? You sure. ask your question. Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm. Uh, this is really. Um, it's it's an observation um, prompted by something that um, uh, Antoine I think poignantly raised. In a way, uh, the 
fact that we don't have a thick uh, ecology of the public, and I totally agree with that in European studies, uh, got connected in your intervention, Antoine, um, to the fact that we scholars of the European Union were kind of insisting on the blurring of the line between private and public. And in a way, you're telling us that uh, by doing this, uh, perhaps unintentionally, definitely in my case, unintentionally, uh, took away the robustness of the attention on the need for a public EU law. Well, um, this is a, a situation in which, you know, best intentions go the wrong way. And um, so the intention, as far as I could construe it back then in the, say, in the 90s, uh, was to show that uh, what was deemed uh, merely private was in fact going to do a lot of work to what we deem public, if by public we need the general rules of the organization of society. Um, when we took a look at what the switch to products liability did in terms of organization of society at large, the point was to notice that the lobbies of the pharmaceutical industry and of the farmers were taking, carving a special regime for them. And that was a purely private law debate, understood as a purely private law debate, and in fact was a gigantic impact on the constitutional um, economic organization of the European Union's member states. So the point was to show in the best legal realist tradition that the more private something was labeled, uh, the more public it was. So the point was to boost the sense that European law, even though it was dealing merely with the market, uh, was in fact changing the notion of public law, including constitutional law. Now, if this message went astray, if this message in fact uh, kind of boomeranged and produced the opposite effect of depleting the logic of the public, the essence of the public in European law and European legal integration, then we need to do something urgently to fix that maybe by sort of um, producing a set of literature that reviews what we have been doing by indeed blurring the divided line. The point was to go towards more public reflection and show that every market privatized reflection was indeed a projection for things that were happening at the public level. Um, please advise us on how to do better if we messed up. <laughs> Thanks, Daniela. Um, Antoine, if you'd like to respond. Uh, so I, I hope um, I hope Daniela, you did understand my intervention as a criticism of your scholarships, which I admire very much. So I, this is really certainly exactly the contrary. But 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 no, I mean, but I, but probably if I was to be a little bit more subtle in my presentation, I would indeed insist more on the sort of boomerang uh, effect, uh, probably of circulation of uh, of. Um, of, 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 of academic work um, towards um, uh, public policy and the sort of circular um, uh, circulation that in a way has probably somehow focused the gaze on this. But my, my, uh, my reflection is not to avoid doing that, but more, for example, for, um, um, for um, sociologists to engage in trying to uh, uh, broaden our understanding of what is the European public. So in a way, criticize the sort of taken for granted understanding of the European public as it is today, essentially understood in terms of interstate, uh, uh, you know, uh, and citizenship uh, or transfers. Um, so in that, in that sense, uh, for historians, for example, also to get back to all forms of forgotten attempts or forgotten uh, um, uh, uh, undertakings that somehow are somehow still there in tension in the history of the EU, but in a way that we have to retrieve. And, and there, has, there have been a lot of uh, a project of, um, of, of defending public autonomy in a way in, in, the, in, the, in the history of the EU. So uh, you could talk about, you know, what, the attempts to build a, a European forms of form of planning in in the 1960s, and of course this is not in form of nostalgia, but in form of understanding the tensions that have somehow been forgotten as you know history has somehow narrowed down the path of the EU. So uh, I think history is a perfect tool to reopen precisely our understanding of uh, of the public uh, of the European public. So 
Um, I'm not saying less of this research, but probably more of a, um, uh, some uh, uh, research, particularly in history and sociology, to to um, to, up to to somehow lengthen the questionnaire uh, around the public. Thank you, um, Maria. I saw you got your hand up. Yeah. Okay, so I would like to you know, still ask a question uh, about the European public. So if we take uh, 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 Thomas's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, like uh, point that he's making for already quite some time, namely, you know, who is actually voting for EU integration and who is in favor of EU integration. So, how far are actually our attempts to, you know, of us academics very often, you know, to create EU public or European public, actually not just expression of our, um, you know, uh, um, no, you know, our class uh, um, difference. Um, so I'm not saying it's not necessary, but you know, I do think that, 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 that they, you know, I mean, that we are, you know, people who actually represent exactly the group which is already uh, on board. Um, and in that, in, that, in, in that connection also, then, then I would like to connect to what Antoine was uh, saying. So what are we ex to expect if, if Melanchon and Anoup uh, um, you know, get uh, get a go, which you know we hope, but but you know, what will it mean for Europe, uh, and what is it, will it mean for European public? Um, should I answer that? I don't know. Yes, please. Maybe this is Stephanie also has <laughs> comments to make on the on the NUP probably uh, <laughs> or NUPES. Um, so, Nouvelle Alliance uh, um, Populaire, Ecologique et Sociale is the acronym for that uh, name. Um, so, um, I don't know. We, we've, uh, I mean, I, I see here, uh, uh, maybe his left now is around Guillaume Sacrist, uh, the fourth co author of the Treaty of Democratization, uh, is one of our colleagues from uh, the Sorbonne. And um, with him, we've, we've, been, we've, we've written a, um, a little text on. On the on, on the on the new uh, pro European program, um, which I think, by many standards, remains very much um, anchored in the uh, uh, 2015, uh, 2015 uh, 2005 sorry referendum. So it's very much connected to a moment of the EU in which uh, you know from. From the constitutional treaty to the to uh, to the financial crisis, uh, there was this idea that the European treaties were sort of you know the sort of authoritarian executive turn that Bermas was talking about. So um, they remain very much, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, very much taken into that. Particularly Mélenchon, I, I have to say, uh, but at the same time, the group is quite diverse. And if you think about, uh, for example, Manon Aubry, who is the head of the GUE, uh, uh, European Left at the European Parliament, and a key member of, uh, I think she has a much more, uh, she's not from that generation, from the founding generation of the party. Uh, she has a very much relaxed understanding of what the EU is, of course, we have a strong program, but uh, not the same sort of uh, uh, opposition. Um, and uh, so in a way, um, the exercise of power would really define everything in that case, because I, I don't think uh, they um, uh, really have a very clear understanding of what legal disobedience means, uh, uh, would entail, I mean, in terms of, of concrete policy. But, uh, but maybe Guillaume or Stephanie could add something. I, I don't think I have much to add, only maybe just to say that, of course, one of the messages that... Um, you know, Antoine and Guillaume in the text that Antoine was just referring to, but other people at large have been trying to communicate to, to, um, to NUP, the Nouvelle Union Populaire, is, is of course that, you know, because the ways in which they have put forth this concept of disobedience as, you know, the flagship element of their identification on the European scene was really to try to communicate with them the notion that, of course, as Antoine was said, disobedience in 2005 doesn't mean the same as in today. And of course, part of the reason is not only uh, that what that the, the 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 situation has changed since the referendum uh, 
but also because of the democratic backsliding that I was talking about. And that you can't talk about disobedience the same way when you have the internal uh, issues that you're facing with, you know, have the governments uh, governing through emergency measures, major backsliding in Poland and Hungary, uh, ongoing conflicts with the, uh, the European Commission or the European Court. Disobedience really doesn't mean the same thing. So, you know, it's not the same to, to be disobedient as they still want to frame it to a sort of neoliberal agenda and to be disobedient to like rule of law and democratic uh, values. Um, thank you so much. I, I want to wrap it up by, by saying thank you so much to Antoine and Stephanie um, for helping us set a series of research agendas, which the European Law Open Project can now interrogate in, in more depth. So thank, thank you again. Well, thank you for the invitation. Okay, I think I want to hand over to Maria now to uh, introduce this final segment of our launch this afternoon. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Diamond, and thank you for amazing chairing, uh, uh, um, very excellently done. Uh, so now I have this kind of more informal part uh, of, of the meeting, um, yeah, in, in uh, more or less in, in, in my hands. Uh, and, I mean, like, and I have to do it because I've actually invented this <laughs> whole not very much, not very well known concept of virtual toast uh, that we want to, to have. Uh, now, the, the idea is, of course, that, that you know, we wanted to have this, uh, this uh, seminar uh, as, as an online uh, seminar also because we wanted to be extremely open, you know, therefore we also have a Zoom meeting and not some webinar. So that, this was really our idea from the beginning. But at the same time, you know, we do not want this to be just yet another, you know, online event. So we have decided to have this uh, small uh, uh, virtual toast. And so, uh, um, so to celebrate a little bit that that Elo has come about, uh, to, to a little bit, yeah, also, you know, express our gratitude to uh, the ELO community, which I think is already uh, um, developing. Also, you know, all the people who have been uh, with us today, uh, the, you know, big numbers for, for uh, online seminars really suggest that there is uh, something going on. Uh, we also have noticed a lot of uh, support and, and, and uh, um, uh, um, yeah, uh, support and, and contribution, not only by our editors, by advisory board, but also just by reviewers and everybody whom we have ever approached uh, to, to do anything for ELO. So we are very happy.